Yes. That's what we've got here tonight. Amen. 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 Here we go. Page 426. Here we go. I heard of the story how Savior came from glory how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Sing it Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me Plunge me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Heard about the cleansing, how it's cleansing by revealing how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, Dear Jesus, come and heal my road. Spirit, and somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Sing it. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me. Plunge me to victory beneath the cleansing flood on the last. I heard about a mansion, his will for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing. And the old redemption story And some sweet day I'll sing up there That song of victory Oh, victory in Jesus My Savior forever He sought me And he bought me With his redeeming blood He loved me Plunge me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Thank you. Thank you. You can be seated. Trying to get it. Okay. <laughs> that was really getting good, wasn't it? It sounded good. Thank you. Okay. Anybody with a special request you'd like to mention tonight? Special request for prayer? Okay, Mark. Okay, great. 
Got to go home from the hospital, okay? Glad to hear that. Yes. I know Willa May wanted us to pray for her and little Brooklyn down in Disney World. And uh, they'll be coming back, I think, this weekend. So we're going to have a safe trip down there and a safe trip back. Right. That's right. Long ways to go with it. Yes, it is. And uh, so let's keep them in our prayers. Who else has one tonight? Yes. Okay, we will sure do it. Also, my sister-in-law, mm -hmm. family out here, it's not Rose, it's just um, sprung real bad. She's still having to wear a boot, but it's not Rose, but it is. That's good. Well, thank the Lord for that. Yes. Thank the Lord. Lord. That's it. That's great. Yeah, I had to wear one of those boots when I broke yeah. my leg and my other foot was broke. Right. But it healed back good. This one did. <laughs> yeah. Joe? Let me pray for Marie. She's worse than she was. Okay. Dad sat back. Okay. Well, we'll definitely keep her in our prayers. Miss Marie. Right. Okay. Anybody else want to mention one tonight? How's Bobby doing, Jackie? I don't know why Taylor just seemed for just a little while. She was doing pretty good, but a couple of days ago, I was over there, and she was just talking all, everything, you know, but I don't know. Yeah. It just comes and goes, but I'd be talking to her, and, and all at once, uh, she just said, she, and she said, have you got any eggs at home? I said, well, yeah, I got eggs at home. Well, did you like them I fixed you the other day? I said, yeah, I like them. I said, well, did you eat them all? I said, no, I did eat them all. She said, well, Go by and pick daddy up, and uh, he'll go down and finish you after eating. You know, <laughs> it's out of blue mist. Uh, Daddy's been dead for a year. Good, and yes. You, know, you just don't, you just don't ever walk, know what you're walking there. Says so she'll know you, but uh, yeah, she can just probably say anything. Oh. Well, yeah. uh, I got a call from the doctor who the other day, and they they want to give me another check on my.
said, well, how's your wife? And he, she said, my wife, he said, June. And he was talking to June. Right. She thinks that he's got some dementia. Mm-hmm. And she said that her granddaddy had it. So pray for us, Brother Lake Spencer and Charles and June Gaines. Okay. I think Rita Wilson has cancer. They said she had a spot on her tongue that was cancerous. Yeah, that's Alvin Tom. Rita Wilson. Yeah. She has a spot on her tongue. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Her sister had that. She passed on. Okay. Let's keep uh, Pauline and Lewis in our prayers. And Catherine and Judy Lynch. Pray for them. Going for a scan this Wednesday. Okay. All right, we sure will. How's Paul doing? Paul's doing pretty good. He got all his uh, testing in. He's got to go next week for a couple of more tests, but so far so good. He said, and he's feeling a little bit better too. Yeah. So keep Paul Black in your prayers. All right. Any other? Spoken request, okay. Let's go to the Lord in prayer then, remember these. Jim, will you leave some prayer tonight? Let's pray. Our Father God, we thank you that we can pray in Jesus' name. Lord, you've heard all the requests and thousands and millions across the United States of America that torn people have been the tornadoes and Oh God, they just go on and on and on and robbery and shooting and, and Lord, even in our church and after people are gone now, God, we want to pray for each and every one of them and have mercy on us, Lord, and watch over us and heal our bodies that we can worship you in spirit and in truth. Be with the pastor tonight and preach the word of God, Lord, yes. and feed us from your word. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jim, for that prayer. Okay, um, I believe we got all of our announcements in the back from the Easter, and that had a great Sunday, I thought. I sure enjoyed all the Easter services, enjoyed the good uh, breakfast. How many ate too much? Anybody eat too much? <laughs> Went hard to do, wasn't it? That was really good food. 
But uh, right now, I don't think there's any special announcements, so we'll just go ahead and take the offering up. Uh, let's see here. Dad, you want to help us? Yeah. And uh, Donald, you want to help us tonight? Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. All right. <clears throat> okay, Dad, you lead us in prayer before we take the offering up. Thank you, Father. We thank you for this opportunity to come and worship you in truth and spirit. And kind of, Father, please bless all of those who are sick, and may we take this uh, contributions and use it for a good purpose, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <laughs> Everybody stand in honor of the Lord and we'll sing Amazing Grace. <clears throat> First and last point. So you want me to go ahead and start? Yeah. It might be a good idea. <laughs> amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Amen. 
about heaven. It teaches us so much about salvation. Yeah. It teaches us so much about Jesus. And uh, I think it'll really be a blessing to you. Um, you can actually go online and order you a little pamphlet and it'll have all of this in it in color. But as you see there, the tabernacle. What was the tabernacle? Well, it was the first place of worship that the children of Israel had and there you kind of get an idea of how it all looked the uh, tent surrounding it or the different tribes and of course right in here is the door that's the brazen altar right here and then this is the holy place and then this back here in the back is the holy of holies where the fire was lit and the cloud miraculously stayed. Here's a picture of the high priest. But it had a uh, woven animal skins all the way around the outside of it. And this was kind of like the little courtyard. And it wasn't quite as big as the temple was, but it was big enough for them to move it. It's a portable, yeah. portable worship center. And so... We have the introduction, we have the courtyard, we're going to be looking at the holy place, and all the furniture in the holy place, uh, the most holy, the holy of holies, and the high priest himself. <clears throat> okay, God commanded Moses, Moses, you go build a tabernacle. So if you have your Bible, let's look at it in Exodus chapter 25. Get an idea of what God is trying to tell Moses to do. Uh, they needed somewhere they could worship God. They needed somewhere where they could sacrifice to God. And so they built this tabernacle. Exodus 25. And we see it in the first nine verses here. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, speaking to the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering. Bring them bringing the offerings together before they build it so that every man that giveth it willingly with his heart ye he shall take of my offering. This is the offering which ye shall take of them. There's a lot of gold, a lot of silver, a lot of brass. Then there's blue, purple, scarlet, fine linen and cotton. And then there's goat's hair. Ram skin dyed red, badger skins, shittim wood, oil for the light, uh, spices for the anointing oil, and for the sweet incense. 
and the onyx stone, the stones to be set in the ephod, and the breastplate. Now the high priest had a, a, a breastplate that had 12 stones in it. And each one of those stones represented one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he said, Make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I showed thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof. Even so shall ye make it. Now, the tabernacle was a movable tent of meeting, a portable worship center. They could set it up. They could take it down. How many years did they use it out there in the wilderness? Forty years. Forty years. And so at night there would be a, a fire. During the day there'd be a cloud. And when the fire would stop, or the cloud would stop, that's where they would stop. Then they, if you picked up and started moving, they had to take the tents up, pack up the tabernacle, and move with it. And so the tabernacle was a movable tent of meeting. God wanted to dwell among his people, the Israelites, in order to have fellowship with them. You see that down in verse number 22. Chapter 25, verse number 22. And there I will meet with thee. And I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat between the two cherubims. Now what are the cherubims? They're angels. They're golden angels on top of the mercy seat. The mercy seat is the holy of holies. It's about as big as, it's a box. About as big as this communion box up here. And on the top of it, there was a golden lid called the mercy seat. In, in the middle of it, there were three articles that were saved. There was the Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod that budded, and a pot of manna. All three of them were saved in the tabernacle, in the Holy of Holies, in that holy ark, they call it. Did you, anybody in here ever see Search of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones? <laughs> uh, he was trying to find it. He's looking in the wrong place. <laughs> He still ain't found it. But uh, anyway, God wanted to dwell with us. Now this is kind of just a, a writing, a little diagram of it. So if you look here, the, when, you, when you walk inside the gate, you come inside, here's the brace, brazen labor. It's kind of a bird bath. It's water there. They wash their hands. This is the altar. After they washed their hands, they washed the sacrifice. Then they took it over here. There's four horns on it. We'll see them in a minute. They were to hold the sacrifice in place. And then they could go, the priests could go in here. The regular people couldn't go inside the holy place. And only one man could go inside the holy of holies. And that's the high priest. He could only do it once a day. I mean, once a year on the day of atonement. Then there was a fence that went all the way around it, made out of those animal skins I talked about. And so, when you look at this, the golden lampstand, the altar of incense, the table of showbread, are the different furniture that's in the holy place. And then there's only one here in the holy of holies. That's that uh, Ark of the Covenant. As I said, it's about the size of of the communion table. And in between these two rooms, there was a veil, big, thick curtain. It was about 17 to 20 inches thick. Nobody could grab it and tear it. And when Jesus died on the cross, God took the veil of the temple and tore it from top to bottom. And that opened up the way of access. Now we don't have to go through a priest. We don't even have to go through a preacher or a missionary. Yeah. We can go straight into the presence of God right. and talk to the Lord and, and let Him know our requests. So the introduction. The tabernacle and its courtyard were constructed according to a pattern laid down by God. God gave them the way to do it. You'll see that in chapter 27, verse number 9. 
chapter 27, verse number 9, Thou shalt make the court of the tabernacle, for the south side southward there shall be hangings for the court of fine twine linen, and of a hundred cubits long for one side. It's about a hundred and fifty feet long. hundred and fifty feet long. That's about half the size of a football field. Football field, I think, is about 300 feet long, 100 yards. Uh, this is about half of that. So it was pretty good distance there from one end to the other. And they moved it any time the cloud moved. They had to take it up. They had to move it. Now, when we study the tabernacle, we understand God's pattern of worship. The tabernacle shows the common people how to have fellowship with a holy God. The tabernacle was in the very center of the camp. The twelve tribes were camped around this holy tabernacle. Now it was Israel's spiritual center for 500 years. I mean, you'd think they'd have had something more permanent before then, but they didn't do it until Solomon finally built the temple. David wanted to build a temple, and we'll study the temple next. It was more of a permanent worship service and a worship place of worship. But uh, God wouldn't let David build it. You might remember why God wouldn't let David build it? Killed too many. Killed too many. Man of war. He said, David, you got blood on your hands. You can get the materials ready, but your son Solomon will have to be the one that builds the temple which would come about 500 years later. So this was built about 1400 B.C., and the temple was built about 900 B.C. So it's pretty ancient. It was their spiritual center for 500 years till Solomon's temple. Fifty chapters in the Bible discuss the tabernacle. We won't have time to do all of the 50, but we'll hit the high spots. Now, the tabernacle was built using valuable possessions, such as gold, silver, bronze, precious wood, rare cloths. The gold in the tabernacle totaled over one ton. It's a lot of gold. In modern times, it would cost over one million dollars very easily. Offerings from the Israelites paid for all the materials. We just read that. They, he told us to bring your gold, your silver, your precious stones, bring all of your um, valuables, and we will make a tabernacle. Mm -hmm. Now, what was this tabernacle? It's a shadow. It's an object lesson. The real tabernacle is in heaven. This one was earthly tabernacle. It was just to show people what was going on in heaven. When Jesus died, as we said over the Easter holidays, he took his blood and went to the tabernacle in heaven, and on that mercy seat, he sprinkled his blood on the, on the heavenly one. But in the earthly tabernacle, the high priest would sprinkle the blood once a year on the Day of Atonement. He would take the sacrifice he would sprinkle the blood. It would not cleanse anybody's sin. It would make God pass over their sin. One more year. Yeah. One more year. And the high priest had to have a, a rope tied onto his foot. And he had to have bells on his garment. And if he went in there with sin in his heart, then God would strike him down. And they'd have to pull him out. If they didn't hear those bells are ringing, yeah. they, nobody could go in and get him because they'd be struck down too. They'd start pulling the rope and get him out of there because he would be dead. So it's a very sacred responsibility. Tabernacle foreshadowed the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. You can see that in Hebrews chapter 9. The real tabernacle is in heaven where Jesus is the high priest. Now let's look at that just quickly. Hebrews in the New Testament, chapter 8, 1 through 5. Hebrews 8, 1 through 5. Aren't 
aren't you glad you have a heavenly great high priest who offers sacrifice of his own blood so we can be saved? Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. Okay, let's see here. I'm 6. You found it yet? 7, 8. There it is. All right. Now the things which we have spoken, this is the Son. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. That's Jesus. A minister of the sanctuary. This is the heavenly sanctuary. And of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. Now, got man, by the way, man could not use certain tools when he made the tabernacle. It had to be very quiet. And uh, we'll study that a little bit later. But in heaven, God himself made that tabernacle and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are already priests offering gifts according to the law, who serve as the example. They're just examples of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou makest all things according to the pattern Show thee in the mount. So he said, I want you to make it like the one in heaven, but you'll never be able to make one just like that one. God made that one. Okay, the courtyard. This is the outer part. There was the gate. There was the fence made out of animal skins. There was the bronze altar of which they put those bulls and goats and lambs. They'd offer them, they'd cut them up, they'd wash them, and they'd put them on that altar and offer them as a sacrifice. Now guess who got to eat all the meat? The priest. Yeah. The priestly tribe. That's how they were sustained. They didn't have any land. God never gave them any land, but he did give them the leftovers. And he gave them several cities, but not a not a big tribe of land. Uh, their work was to do the work at the tabernacle. And then the bronze laver. Does anybody have a bird bath in the backyard? Okay, several of you do. That's what this was like. It was like a bird bath. It had water in it, and they would wash their hands and wash the uh, sacrifice before they went over an altar. Uh, onto the altar and, and uh, offer it. Here's the gate. All right. Exodus chapter 27, verse 16. And let me get back over there to Exodus chapter 27. And let's see. 16. This is where they came in. This is the door. Exodus 27, verse number 16. Okay. And for the gate of the court shall be a hanging of 20 cubits, 30 feet, of blue, of purple, scarlet, fine twine linen, wrought with needlework, as their pillars shall be four, and their sockets shall be four. Now look over into chapter, or 28 there. I'm sorry, 38. Go up about another 10 chapters there. Chapter 38, verses 18 and 19. Okay. The hanging for the gate of the court was needlework work of blue, purple, scarlet, fine twine linen, 20 cubits was the length and the height and the breadth was 5 cubits answerable to the hangings of the court. And the pillars were 4, their sockets of brass were 4, the hooks were of silver, the overlaying of their capitals or their bands with fillets of silver and all the pins of the tabernacle in the court 
They were made of brass. So it's a beautiful piece of artwork. When you look at it, it's all different colors. That would be right here. This would be the entrance to come inside the tabernacle. And there's a picture of it. Right down here in the bottom. That's how they got in. It was one way in. Now, what does that tell us about Jesus? There's one way to go to heaven. That's through Jesus Christ. There's no other way. Okay? The gate. We just talked about a little bit about the gate there. The entrance to the court was made with hanging curtains. They were blue, purple, scarlet. Uh, that would really make a... Boy, I bet you'd be able to see that from a long way. Out there in that desert. How pretty that would be. Four pillars of brass, sockets of bronze. The gate of the courtyard measured about 20 cubits, about five cubits high. That's about 30 foot by seven and a half foot high. Uh, not quite as high as the ceiling there. But it was high enough where you couldn't look over it. Unless you were Samson, or, I mean, uh, Goliath. I don't think Samson was that big. But I believe Goliath might have been around nine or ten feet. The gate separated the people from the magnificent holy God. God could only be approached with repentance and sacrifice when the people came inside the gate. Jesus referred to himself as the gate of the door. Anyone who entered through Jesus receives eternal life. Boy, I'm glad of that. Praise God. You might want to underline John chapter 10, verse number 9. We're preaching through John on Sunday mornings, but this is a, one of those verses that uh, you'll want to memorize. He's the door. There's no other way in. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Woo, that makes me excited. Because I know him, and I know you know him too. If you trust in Christ. Okay, now here's the fence. You notice the fence is seven and a half foot high. It's about 30 feet long. Certain area there. That would be the fence coming around the outside of it. Kind of a square. That's the gate. That's the fence. Okay. Now, let's look at it in chapter 27. Just read that first one there. Exodus chapter 27 and verse 9 down through verse 18. Exodus 27 verse 9 through 18. Thou shalt make the court of the tabernacle for the south side southward there shall be hangings the cord of fine twine linen, a hundred cubits long, 150 feet long it would be. Twenty pillars thereof, their sockets will be of brass, the hooks of the pillars and the fillets shall be of silver, and likewise for the north side, and then the length will be the hangings of a hundred cubits long, twenty pillars, twenty sockets of brass, and the hooks and the pillars of fillets of silver, and the breadth of the cord the west side shall be 50 cubits, about 75 feet, pillars of 10, the sockets of 10, and the breadth of the court on the east side, and remember, this is a whole lot bigger than the gate, and the gate was only about, what was it, 75, I think, or something like that, how much? 30 feet. 
30, yeah, 30 feet. Only 30 feet across. This is 150 feet long, 75 feet wide. Okay? Now, verse 11, Likewise for the north side of the length there will be hangings of 100 cubits long, 20 pillars, and then verse number 12, And the breadth of the court on the west side, hangings of 50 cubits, pillars of 10, and sockets of 10. The breadth of the court on the east side shall be 50 cubits, the hangings of the one side of the gate, 15 cubits, three pillars, three sockets, and on the east side shall be hangings of 15 cubits, their pillars of three, and for the gate of the court shall be a hanging of 20 cubits. We've already talked about that. So we got the gate so far, and we've got the fence. Now you got to put something inside of it. Uh, the court fence was the outer border of this tabernacle site. It had linen curtains, probably white. Linen usually is white. And that shows purity. Pillars, sockets, hooks, fillets, tops and rods, kind of like a curtain. Pins of bronze. So this is kind of what it would look like. 100 cubits long, 50 cubits wide. 75 foot wide, 150 feet long. And this was what it would look like from the side. It just looked like a, a fence. Basically what it was, seven and a half foot high. Went all the way around. Okay. 150 foot by 75 foot by seven and a half foot high. So that's the fence. Now, if anybody was playing baseball, you might be able to knock it out of that fence. <laughs> but it's a holy place, so you wouldn't be able to play there. That's for sure. Now we're getting into the furniture. There's two kinds of furniture. There's some furniture inside of the holy place, and then there's furniture out here in the courtyard. This is out in the yard. First thing you would see there would be this brazen altar. It's a beautiful altar in it. Covered with brass. You see there's four horns on it. One, two, three, four. They use them as hooks to stick the sacrifice down. They fire this up down in the bottom. They would come through these holes and sometimes they would completely consume the sacrifice. At other times, there was some left for the priests. Now, when they carried this Ark of the Covenant, they had to carry it by these rods. And if they didn't carry it by the rods, they'd be struck down. Uzziah tried to keep it from hitting the ground in the Old Testament. The Philistines had stolen it. Now, actually, it wasn't, it wasn't this. It was the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah. yeah, that's what it was. But the Philistines had stolen the Ark of the Covenant. And it's something kind of like this. We'll get to it in just a moment. But it toppled over. He reached his hand under there to keep it from hitting the bottom. And God struck him down. And everybody said, well, he shouldn't have done that. He was trying to catch the Ark of the Covenant. Yes, but God had already told him, when you move it, you move it the way I tell you to move it. And he was showing them he was a holy God. So there it is, the bronze altar. And it's right in front of the door. Right there's the door, there's the altar. Brian's altar was made of shittim of acacia wood covered with brass. As I said, it had four horns. There's the priest getting ready to offer a lamb. Kind of sad, isn't it? Thank God we don't have to do that anymore. There was one who took every one of our sacrifices 
he was the fulfillment. They take that little lamb, they hook him up here on this and burn him up. Now, there were some utensils they used. Bronze pans to receive the ashes. They would take the ashes, mix it with oil, and anoint the head of the priest. Bronze shovels, bronze basin, bronze flesh hooks that would move them around on there, and then bronze fire pan. A bronze grate with a bronze ring and each corner was put under the bronze altar. Hollow staves carrying poles made with acacia wood covered with bronze were used to carry the altar. Now the measurements of the bronze altar, how big was it? It was about seven and a half foot. Five cubits long, seven and a half foot wide, seven and a half foot long about four and a half foot high. So that's the first piece. That's where all those thousands and thousands and thousands sacrifices were offered. On that one brazen altar. Now, here's something else. When they got ready to build the temple, they just took these pieces of furniture and moved them into the temple. They didn't build new ones. They used these inside the temple. Several kinds of offerings were made on the bronze altar. There was the burnt offering. Now when it says burnt offering, you always remember this. This is the offering that is burned up totally to ashes. Nothing left. That would be a bull, a sheep, a goat. Couldn't have a blemish. Couldn't have any broken bones. Couldn't have any spots on him. Had to be perfect. And even birds, for those who were poor, couldn't afford those big, bigger sacrifices. Um, when God told Abraham to take Isaac on Mount Moriah, and offer him as a burnt offering. That's what God was asking Abraham to do. And we always think God was asking Abraham to go up there and kill his son with a knife. You know, and then bury him or something. But that wasn't the case. What God was really asking Abraham to do was to take the knife, kill his son, cut the pieces of his son up, wash them all clean, throw them in a fire, and consume them until there was nothing left but ashes. That'd be hard to do for your own son, wouldn't it? That's what God asked Abraham to do. But here's the good thing. The book of Romans tells us that Abraham said, before he figured out what was going to happen, now what happened in the end of the story? Does anybody remember what happened at the very end? Didn't have to kill him. They was around. Abraham over there caught in the thicket and they brought him out and offered him instead. But, but Romans says that Abraham thought to himself, God gave him to me one time so he can raise him back from the dead and give him to me again. So he had faith. He had faith that God was going to bless him. So that's the bronze altar there. They had the rain offerings. They had peace offerings. Goats or lambs. So the burnt offering, the grain offering, the peace offering. Then there was the sin offering on the Day of Atonement. One time a year, as I said, the high priest would go inside where the Holy of Holies were, was. And he would sprinkle the blood from a sacrifice on top of that golden slab called the mercy seat. It was about that thick. It was about this long and about that wide and, and there would be two cherubims, golden cherubims 
sitting on top of that mercy seat. And in the middle of it, there was that Shekinah glory cloud of God. And that cloud would move when God wanted them to move. And it would settle down when he wanted them to stay. So in itself, that's a miracle. Then there was that trespass offering. That was a female of the flock, a lamb, goat, bird, or grain. These are just the different offerings that were made. The grain offering. You see, the grain offering had all the grain and uh, no meat. This is the vegetarian offering. <laughs> This is the vegetarian offering here. The peace offering. Now there was a piece of meat there. <laughs> That's for the meat eater. The sacrifice was necessary for forgiveness. The blood of the animal was important to justify the people before God. Without the shedding of blood, there is no what? No remission. No forgiveness. No remission of sin. A proper sacrifice was an animal that was valuable, perfect, not flawed. Because Jesus Christ was perfect. Perfect. And it had to be representing Jesus Christ. Sin was serious. Only shed blood which stands for life could pay for sin. The life of the flesh is in the blood. If you take the blood out, you lose your life. There have been people who have literally died because of a small wound, but they lost too much blood. That's why the life of the flesh is in the blood. By laying his hand on it, the person identified with that animal that was sacrificed. There they are, making the atonement. <coughs> there's the little lamb, there's the brazen altar. I believe we'll stop right there. It's 8 o'clock. We did get through the covering. We did get through the curtain. We did get through the entrance. Now we're inside the courtyard and looking at the brazen altar. That reminds us that Jesus Christ was our sacrifice. If you're glad of that, let's give him a big amen. Ready? Amen. 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 Okay, let's be dismissed in prayer. Father, thank you for letting us come together tonight. Thank you, Lord, for letting us study this tabernacle. What a wonderful study. It's a picture of what Jesus did for us on the cross. So many pictures we'll be studying in this. Father, we know that every one of them point to a perfect Savior who is our great high priest seated at the perfect tabernacle in heaven. He's up there right now making intercession for us. And so for that, we're so thankful we pray that you'll bless everyone here tonight, whatever needs they may have, whatever may be a burden on their heart. I pray you just help each one in Jesus' name. All of God's people said together, Amen. 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 Okay, you're dismissed. Tell somebody you love them. Good to see them in church. Thank you for coming tonight. God bless you. Yeah, just the screen.
Isn't that, that's amazing. That's amazing. It is. That's the Lord's work. Because you know, he's a just God and a loving God. 